Corey Davis. I'm Elijah Johnson. Yeah. Michael Cummings, the third. Niles Hightower. And I'm Coach Wimberly. And this is In The Zone's podcast. This is our fourth, fifth episode? Fifth. This is our fifth five. episode. And we have a special guest. Um, he's special to all of us because he coached us. Um, he's special to most of the people watching because you know him from either being an assembly man, being a head coach for how many years? A lot of years. A lot of years. <laughs> a lot of years. Forever. <laughs> this is being Mr. Wimberly. So welcome, Coach Wimberly, to our new round table that we're having. We're enjoying some good food from Joe's Zone. How your, how your food? Good. Yo, if you come to Joe's so Zone, I was gonna save it for yeah, last. Shout out your food. Your food. Your food. Every, everything's great, but after, after I just realized this is your fifth show, yeah. Yeah. and you just have me as the guest. See, that's, man, everybody yeah. see me after practice. It's <laughs> <laughs> <That's> terrible. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's crazy. crazy. That's I got to think about Def Jam. You may know about it a little bit. <laughs> but we'll, yeah, yeah. we'll get on that because somebody had Def Jam before. But oh uh, yeah, tell them about these wings that you've been. Yo, if you come to Joe's Zone, bro, do you see this wing right here, bro? I'm not gonna. A lot. This garlic palm wing, and, it, and it's a wet wing. You know how garlic palms usually dry. This is a garlic palm wet wing. Wet wing fire. I could validate. I had one. Mm-hmm. Wow. Good. They're good. Yeah. I gotta try these next sure. time. And I got a um, it's a pumpkin spice frappe. It's a. That's nice. That's real nice. It's real folly, the pumpkin. Yeah, spice. Real's real folly. Yeah, Starting off nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Starting off school. Right, yeah, so shout out to the people at Joe's Zone because this food is immaculate. The drinks are immaculate too. The peachy palmer, you know, I'm always going. That's my favorite. But um, we're going to jump right into it with you, Coach. Um, We're going to act like we don't talk to you every day. So just, <laughs> <laughs> just tell us a little bit about your background, about how you started and your love for football and love for sports in general. Well, I, I've been coaching. I started coaching youth baseball when I was in college and um that was 1983 uh, 83 <laughs> 82 1982 before any of were born you i helped them. with a a football league in patterson called a uh, pimple patterson midget football league where we helped them get it together lou mathis uh ray light senior al moody some great guys out of that league came some great football players and we were the models that helped them out because we were 18 years old that next year with baseball, I worked with Jimmy Salmon with a team called Patterson Task Force and helped out with Little League Baseball with his team, McDonald's. So I've actually been coaching for that long. And even when I came home during the summer, during the college, I would always help out, you know, with the recreation, whatever league. And when I graduated, I was hired at Eastside High School as a teacher, started off as a football coach and baseball coach there, and, uh, and was there for six years as a football coach, nine years as a baseball coach, and in 1995, I was hired at Patterson Catholic, where I was there for 14 years as the head football coach and took a little time off, got involved in politics, became a city councilman, but wasn't done yet. Came to Hackensack High School in 2012, had an opportunity to coach you guys and was at Hackensack for nine years. And currently still not uh, retired, helping still out at say, <laughs> still not retired, uh, still tr- love hanging around, you know, sports and kids and work with young folks and develop them. So, uh, the last two years have been at St. Joe's Montville helping out, you know, uh, with the squad. Uh, you was getting into talking about uh, playing baseball and coaching baseball. I heard you was nice in baseball, too. What made you take in, in, uh, a liking into more into football than baseball? Uh, just the passion of it. Uh, this football is just the family aspect of football is just where I think I was able to develop, you know, the character of young men and stuff. Now, not that it was any different in baseball. In baseball, we had great success. I mean, we uh, won 100 games, won a county championship, the first ever in Eastside High School League championship, first ever. Traveled to Puerto Rico four times with my team uh, then. Yeah. Uh, had two kids drafted, uh, Danny Singletary to the Arizona Diamondbacks, Carl McKenzie to the Pittsburgh Pirates, a bunch of college kids. Oh, that's cool. And that's more fun. importantly, though, it just was that team building. But when I got to Patterson Catholic, I knew I couldn't do both. So I had to choose. So for three years, I was the head baseball coach at the East Side and the head football coach at Patterson Catholic. And it really uh, it was too much. I, yeah, I, I really wanted to give my all, and I decided to go with football. football. Mm-hmm. All right. So explain to us, like we're we're not us. How was your transition going from PC to Agnes? Uh the, the transition was different. I mean, at PC, the success was crazy. We won seven state championships, eight league championships. Uh, you know, eighty plus guys, I think, got Division One scholarships. And it was a private school. So at a private school, you could kind of go get your dudes who you want to get your dudes, you know? Mm-hmm. So we had, like, the depth of the talent was crazy. And the amount of talent that we had was at a high level. 
And I tell people to this day, if Patterson Catholic doesn't close, I don't know how far we would have gotten to. That last year, I think the last couple of years, we went 70 and three. Yeah, you know, so, so it, it was it was something crazy it's like that. Downstairs. But there is a major <laughs> advantage. You got, regardless of what people say, when you have a private school, you know, it's not also about recruiting. Kids came to me. I mean, I had that run that you see the Essex County crew. I had Essex County. I had kids from New York. I had kids from Bergen County coming to me to, to play football because they wanted a chance to get a scholarship. Yeah. And I tell everybody the scholarship is like winning a lottery. You're getting $150,000 by going to school. So, you know, contrary to what people want to think, you know, it wasn't about that. And the culture was great. Like, our practices were brutal. <laughs> like, when I say a brutal practice, like, you know, I probably, when I got to hack sack with you guys, it wasn't as intense because uh, of... Yeah, I wasn't that PC, but... Uh, but but, <laughs> but I, I didn't get too many complaints, put it that way. Wow. And in public school, I think sometimes you got to, you know, conform to the community. And that was something I had to learn by, you know, not being from Hackensack, going there. And I think you were there the first night. You remember that first night of practice, that yeah. Sunday night practice we had? Yeah, until like 11 p.m. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I said, oh, wait, oh, wait, oh, wait. Oh, wait, oh, wait. I got a lot of calls after that. Like, this guy crazy. Like, why are we running like this? How many 110s? You know? so, so it was a little different to push. And, um, you know, we would go to camp at Patterson Catholic uh, for five, six days upstate New York. And, um, you know, I'm not a head coach anymore, but those practices were, you know, you woke up in the morning, practice, you got a little break, you practice, practice a little bit more, came back out, practice. So it was a different type of toughness and a mentality to it. But what I, what I did like was the grasp of the community at Hackensack. Once they realized that I wasn't crazy, like, all right, I'll, I'll buy into this stuff, you know. And we had pretty good success. I mean, we won three league championships. A bunch of you guys went on to play college football, you know, and early that we had success and I think was there. And I think that the change is the community change. You know, you're only in a, in a uh, public school, you're only really as good as your feeder programs. So if your feeder programs don't buy into what you're talking about, you're in trouble. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's true. Um, now, uh, hold on, I just gotta get this out the way real quick, real quick. So for the Wimberley era at Hackensack, clear the air, who is your favorite <laughs> class? I need to hear it right now. Who's your favorite class? My favorite class. Your favorite class, <laughs> Wimberley era at Hackensack. I, I wouldn't say I have a favorite class. You guys were good. You know, that, that class was really good. What so I like, so what, you, what you heard it there, bro. <laughs> 2013 yeah. is his favorite class. Our season was 2012. 12, but we're class at 13. 13. Yeah, yeah. But um, uh, we had a good run for like a three-year period of some really good teams with Jason Thompson, Mikey Sanchez, and him. And we just ran into a buzzsaw against Montclair. Oh, yeah. that, that team, we were 9-1 going into the semifinals. And um, the quarterback went to Boston College. Oh, the running back went to Ohio State. Oh, this guy went here. <laughs> they and they were loaded. And then they blew out Ridgewood in the championship like 30-something to nothing. But that was just our seeding was bad that year. And then the following year, we lost to Tech with a minute and 45 seconds left in the game. Uh, we should have sailed the game. That team was pretty good, too. And I mean the talent. What I liked about you guys and then that group with uh, Tommy Smith and those dudes, them dudes was crazy. And they were my type of guy. <laughs> like, they just was like uh, uh, Jordan and, oh, my God, Hunter. Oh, yeah. They, uh, oh, yeah. Ant and all them guys, yeah, yeah. they were my type of football players yeah. because they didn't have any fear. Uh -uh. Like when we went out there, it was like, yo, we don't care who we playing. And I remember we used to scrimmage like Bergen and stuff. People were like, why are you scrimmaging Bergen? Because we want that heat. Yeah. You know, we want that heat. We we ain't running from heat. So that that was the difference of here. But then that era was really good. That era is really good. Okay. Um, I didn't want to jump over the the PC aspect because that's such a huge portion of of I mean your coaching career and like New Jersey in general is like. The, the culture at PC kind of changed the dynamic, I think, for, like, Catholic schools. And I think it was that era of, like, PC was dominant for a very long time. Like, can you touch on a little bit more descriptive about, like, the players that you had and, and just, like, the, the championships that you had won there? Yeah, the, the run was the, the mix of talent. So our first couple of championships were Patterson-based teams. So 99, 2000. Uh, we have Lorenzo Crawford, you remember Coach L used to help out all these guys, Notre Dame and uh, Shadu Moore when the Boston College was a All-American, but it was local talent. So we were good just with them dudes from Patterson and this, that area. We may get a Passaic kid every now and then, maybe one or two Clifton, but when we expanded our talent pool, when you're talking about that 07, uh, 08, 09, Dudes, That's like what everybody we to went to Nork. We we had Nork. We had East Orange. We had Patterson. We had uh, some Bergen County kids on that squad. Passaic, like dudes wanted to play, 
And at that point, there wasn't a big, a, a large amount of kids from Newark and all them playing at Bergen or Bosco and all them. But they me, I was like, I'm going to find them dudes. <laughs> like, and, and we had this one dude named G5, Greg Moore. So Greg Moore came as a freshman from Newark and he won three state championships. But Greg was kind of like a Pied Piper. But before that, we had the East Orange, Malcolm Harris from the Jaguars. Malcolm Harris bought dudes. Uh, Algafar Lane, Malcolm went to Purdue. Uh, uh, Algafar went to Rutgers. These dudes were dudes. And when I say dudes, like our practices, I can't even explain how, like we had dudes who didn't start as juniors and got scholarships as seniors. Hmm. That, that's how, how tough it was. So. The amount, even though we didn't have a large amount of kids, we only have 45, 50 kids, that depth of talent was crazy. And, and then when I, when I say it, when we played tougher games and stuff, we literally would beat ourselves sometimes because it got to the point where our schedule really should have been anteed up because when we played um, in 07 or 08, we played a team from Florida, and we had a quarterback who was out, had to sit 30 days, Wayne Mack, dude. He, I had to put a wide receiver at quarterback, and we played a team called Florida Christian. And Florida Christian had a loss a game in three years. We played them at Montclair State, which is crazy. We beat them 19 to six. And at that point, I knew. Because when we walked out in the pregame, I'm saying to myself, and Bo looking at me, Coach Bo, I'm like, oh, we get ready to get piped out here. We get ready to get killed. And these dudes had like gold fronts, gold chains, dreadlocks. I said, oh my God, this is gonna be tough. And we beat them 19 to six. At that point, I said, we different. We're, we're different. We're a little different, yeah. And it was discipline too. I remember that game, we knew practicing all week, we made them jump off sides. You know how I practice going on three every day? We made them jump off sides like eight times. So we, the game, we would start the downs first and five, first and five. And we just eight o'clock, eight o'clock, eight o'clock. Went to Kings, two tight ends. And, and you know, that's when I knew like, we're a little different. So to follow up on that, you mentioned a lot of players from different areas and different environments. And me speaking personally from just us here, and you always connect with no matter the player. How do you balance the different egos, the different attitudes, and just build a family no matter what year it is? Yeah, I, I mean, that, that was always been part of the preseason. You know, you know how brutal our preseason was. Like, you know, the summer times when everybody was at the shore and going away and, you know, they have new rules now, 10 days off and yeah, all that stuff. Mm. We practice every day almost. Every day. Like, so yeah. that mentality Balance. of tightness brought you together. Um, when you were talking about fourth quarter mm -hmm. and you're, you're talking about pushing out them push-ups at the end, it's a bond. And that's what I think was created over the years. So it didn't matter if you came from Newark, if you came from Patterson, you were dealing with Wimberley in this craziness of like conditioning, you know, of how, and it was not just physical conditioning, we were mentally conditioning. Yeah. So that's where I think the Eagles were checked. And the coaches, I think my coaches yeah, always coaches led by example. Sure. We didn't have a lot of coaches with Eagles. Mm -hmm. Like my coaches who were there could have went to other places, God rest, Coach Smith. Yeah. Like Coach Smith was a great coach yeah, sure. and I was only as good as him. Because with all my antics and all the other stuff, he really kind of was the day-to-day -day mind behind. Like, he, he would he look at me, all right, you go ahead and do all that stuff. And go, no, that's not going to work. And we never argue. So he would be the person that analyzed everything that we did. And, and you're, you need a Coach Smith, yeah. you know. And, and I would tell anybody, my success, I was as successful as Coach Smith. Like, he didn't come on into 2000. Uh, before that, we had a defense coordinator who played at Penn State and, you know, good guy and stuff like that. But when Coach Smith came on and took over our defense, total, total difference. And then it was just a day-to-day -day operation. I knew that we never missed a beat with me not being there. Like, mm -hmm. if I just had to walk away, go talk to a parent, he kept yeah, things in check. Rolling. Yeah. And then, and then when it came down to film and stuff like that, he would stay up all night and watch film and just give me, like, reports and different stuff. Like, you need a guy yeah, like Coach Smith. Sure. Yep. Dedicated to the game. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to touch real quick about because you, you you talk about how you, you look for the impact on the, on the youth like and that's that's what drives you to be a coach. So talk to me a little bit about you being a member of Omega Sci Fi and how you came in 2012 and influenced a group of young men because I know from our class alone um, the football team did yeah five men of Omega from yeah just from 2012 13 alone five men of Omega influenced by you and your coaching staff so. Talk to me a little bit about that. that. That's always been, I mean, over my 30-something years, I would say I probably have 
former players and students and stuff, at least 50 something fraternity brothers. So <laughs> that, that's pretty crazy. And, <laughs> and, and, I, and I never, I never, and, and basically, basically didn't understand even when I go back to the East Side days uh, and you laugh about Def Jam. Yeah. Uh, Def Jam has a, mm-hmm. a facet yeah. to it that you go, you know, a discipline of fraternity discipline. and certain things like that. So a lot of the stuff that we came up with when I was younger, now here I am, 23 years old as a coach. Because mm-hmm. the 23 year old Coach Wimberley, you didn't want no parts of this. You didn't want no parts <laughs> of here. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, my son got it quite a few times. So he understood that, you know, the, the, the whole thing of discipline there. And at Eastside, on our staff at the time, I think it's six of us were fraternity brothers. So when we came in and they saw like how disciplined we were and how, you know, my punctuation thing, like, you know, you late, you're getting Def Jam. Yeah. You don't hear it, you're getting Def Jam. No so they doing. knew, you're walking down the hall, you did something, you're getting Def Jam. <laughs> so they knew it was zero tolerance. So the fraternity part, major, major role in, in my coaching style. Yeah, it's amazing, it's amazing. <laughs> to piggyback off of the fraternity part, you have so many different roles. You're an assemblyman, you're a father, you're a husband, um, you're a mentor, you're the director of recreation, I think. There's so many things you do. Neighborhood hero. <laughs> Superman at night. <laughs> How do you balance it all? Uh, structure. And, and it goes back to, you know, college and stuff like that. Uh, when I was in college, I used to carry around a calendar pad to keep track of everything I did. Mm. And people used to joke me about that. But I couldn't remember... Like, all right, I have a panel meeting tonight. I have to do this. This paper is due. And this is before electronics. Mm. So I, I would be, like, really stuck on, like, you know, do not this, want to miss something. Do not want to hear. So I use an old calendar. And I, I use that calendar up into Palm Pilots and stuff. Oh, you wow. know, so I, I, I always thought the discipline and being able to do things. And I always thought 24 hours in a day, I'm not even getting joy in my day. Mm-hmm. And it started off in college. You know, I was involved in everything you know and then when i got out uh the opportunity henry baker gave me my first job coach baker i think you met coach baker his son who coached at maryland db coach oh yeah so i worked for coach baker during the summers as a camp counselor and he was such an inspiration because he was that dude to like dad coach administrator you know i uh, i mean and i watched how he carried his life uh some other mentors i had like al moody different people like that and i said I could do it. And you know, now, 33 years later as a professional, no regrets, no, no regrets at all. And the most gratifying thing is, is that I can look back now and see the doctors, the school administrators, the business people, the, I don't know how many college graduates, business owners, and all different facets that I say, okay, hopefully I had some input in their success. Definitely did, for sure. Um, <laughs> so for, well, we can lead on that. Um, one of your successors who, I mean, is your son. I mean, we have a big event coming up um, at MetLife Stadium. Um, just touch on, I mean, I know we know that you're proud as a dad, um, but touch on how you feel like you've impacted his life and how how this has all came about. Like, how do you feel about Zone 6 and, like, the, the state of Zone 6 now as a company? I'm, I'm proud of all you guys. I mean, here and, and with Justin, I mean, Justin was born into sports. Like, uh, as a director of recreation, uh, you know, people don't understand. Like, we came up with bitty basketball, t ball, weekend swim because of Justin. That was like me instead of going to Ridgewood and pay, you know, a couple of hundred dollars for him to learn how to swim. Why can't I do this in my own community? Instead of him going somewhere else to do flag football and I pay, I create those programs based on being a dad. You know, so that was easy for me. So I want to say I started off as the recreation director in 1998. And Justin at that point was, uh, you know, three years old. So he was involved in that. But even before that, like uh, my wife was in school uh, getting her teaching certification when he was born. So Justin came to practice every day. Almost. So literally he grew up on the football field. He literally grew up. He doesn't probably remember me being a baseball coach much because he was only up to three. But I used to carry him around on Mondays, like for JV games, and have the caboose. And then <laughs> when he's a baby, he just walk around. And then as he got older, every Monday he knew after school or whatever, he came to Patterson Catholic and rode. And he had this little dirt thing, ride around. He learned how to ride bikes there. He did everything. Mm-hmm. And he grew up in a locker room. So for him to go on to Hampton and be a sports management major and 
University of Arkansas and get his master's in sports management recreation, no surprise. I mean, he's literally have his whole life been around sports and been around everything. So any event I went to, Justin went to that event. So I don't care what the situation is, I, I took him with me. So he had the exposure of, you know, uh, NFL teams, NBA, all that, you know. The Nets, we were regulars. I was a season ticket holder at the Nets because of him. I wanted them to be able to go to them. So we get there, he just run around, you know, with the Nets, you know. So it was an uh, easy transition, I think, for him professionally to become involved in sports management. And what you guys are doing in Zone 6, people try to go, oh, this is great. I, I did, all I do is sit back and cheer. <laughs> I'm just sitting back cheering and watching because in indirectly it is part of my legacy. But in reality, you guys have created your own thing. I mean, this is beyond, you know, the scope of what people could think, you know. And when you have young, you know, black men, uh, uh, men of color involved in the community doing something positive, your impact now is when I go places, where's Justin? You know, is, is Zone 6 coming today? They don't ask about me. I'm the old dude. You know, it's like here. But they want that picture. They want to be posted. They wanted a video. And that's, it's, it's cool. That's good. Uh, talk, brag a little bit about uh, so your four J's. So uh, you have my next thing. You already started. <laughs> yeah. So brag a little bit about your four J's. You you talked about J one. So you got J two graduated from your alma mater. Yes. J three. Yeah. Run 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 run, 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 run well, down. I, I mean, each of them I can be more proud. I mean, Justin, like I said, went to Hampton. That was his choice. But that's fine. <laughs> that but crazy. you know, uh, <laughs> that was a little bit of a fight in the house for a while. I mean, Anybody who knows, I, I, I bleed Virginia State, orange and blue. So by Jared going to Virginia State, he made it up for Justin. <laughs> shout out to too. And to be uh, uh, a shout out to Jared. To go to Virginia State, for him to be very successful academically, to be part of New Side Chapter of my fraternity, uh, to create his own niche. I mean, he did the same thing. He went and made his own road at Virginia State. But I never missed a chance to go down there and see him. So <laughs> it, it's great you know, for him to be a college graduate now, a professional, and, and you know, I guess, Working with you guys also, nothing but the best. And then Jordan is a redshirt junior at Hampton. There you go. Uh, so there I've been go. on the highway for the last three weekends at Hampton University. <laughs> it's not as a bad trip. A, <laughs> a lot of yard, a lot of miles. <laughs> uh, that that Route 13 is something. So, yes. but but in turn, you know, it's great. I mean, he's playing football, living out his dream. Was able to get a scholarship. Uh, you know, Jordan played at Hackensack and. Did a, you know, had a, a nice high school career and just played also at GE. So I got two GEs and a new side uh, down there. And then now uh, the, uh, the baby J, you know, J Ford uh, is at Lehigh and is a freshman playing football on a football scholarship. So I'm proud of each and every one of them. But none of this is possible without uh, Kimbo Wimbo. <laughs> so Absolutely. Make it clear. Absolutely. She holds it down yeah. academically. Or when you talk about organization, Shout staying out on top yeah. of stuff. Shout out uh, sure. She don't miss a beat. And in turn, you know, the boys, like their success, you know, I may be on the athletic side of it, but who they are academically, who they are, I think, as far as certain things that they do, I mean, they have all her characteristics, which I, I think is the best in the world, you know, best of both worlds. It's and crazy Coleman you said up. that. It's crazy you said that because. You're true to your word, because you were talking about Justin growing up on the field. While we were all playing, JJ and Jordan were growing up. Is right that, there. Is that yeah, crazy? Exactly. Now you get to yeah, watch right. them. And I actually yeah. had a chance to like coach them. So it was that's like, right. Yeah, weird, like, yeah. You know, yeah. Like, that, that, that's something. And time, that's flying. I mean, when you guys started in, in 12, I mean, how old were they got? Them guys were eight years old, yeah. nine years old, playing people in the wall. Yeah, right. that, right. and out there every night. You know, and that, that was one of the things where – you know, people talk about, you know, the football aspect. I love Jarrett because of that part. Like, Jarrett never missed a practice, even when he was a freshman. He would practice with the varsity on sun the Sunday night practices, you know, which I don't think nobody do those no more, but Sunday night yeah. practices. So on Sunday nights, Jarrett be uh, dressed up, getting in the car with me and going to practice. You know, that was my, my ride or die. Like, all right, let's go. Him, him and Bo and Kev, you know. We <laughs> practice, that's it. They're practicing. And, and, I, and I would say that even with them, I think growing up, I think it made them more of a success in the classroom and who they're going to be because of their commitment. They understand, like, loyalty and commitment is everything. And I think they've heard that so much that that's who they are. Three, three out of four sons, men of Omega. JJ. <laughs> no pressure. Your time is coming. Your time is coming, JJ. It's coming. Now, now you're, you're at St. Joe's now. Um, you're back at the Catholic school. Um, 
Um, like we went to a game, we went to Don Bosco, it was Don Bosco versus St. Joe's. We actually got to see them live, and they had a lot of athletes, but they looked like they were young. I don't know if I could be wrong. Yeah, I, you know, and and this fully, you know, I've I've been due to me going to my son's games. Mm -hmm. I haven't been around as much as I was last year, yeah. but the talent level of the young kids at St. Joe's is the real deal. Yeah. Do you have um, any like any diamonds in the rough that you that we should? I, be out for? I mean, I have favorites. I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and as you know, when it, when you a dude, I'm like Bo, you a dude, yeah. and that's how more classes crazy yeah. you know I mean uh, uh, Jamir Joseph I think got a, a Georgia offer uh, one of my favorites is the kid Jojo Williams number one dude mm -hmm. his best is yet to come I mean uh, uh, Nate Bailey the freshman kid I mean they're, they're just, they got dudes and they're averaging like 50 points a game yeah. shout out to my man coach Gibbs and that <laughs> they're, they're doing. I mean they're they're really lighting it up and the best is yet to come in St. Joe's football I believe I mean, that talent level is crazy. And little Joey Gaston steps in for Luke. Yeah, and what, here. What year was he? No. He's a sophomore. He's a sophomore. Oh sophomore. Yeah. And put up, led him to 63 points the other day. And then the overall talent, I mean, I love it. Luke Tucci. I think this is Tucci. Tucci right? yeah. Luke Tucci has gotten a chance. When they say next man up, Luke has set it out. He has, look, a next man up, he's a ETS guy. Shout out to Reggie at ETS, one of my former players. Wow. Uh, you know, and he talked to me about Luke. And Luke, I'm just so happy for him because he shows that running from it will not save you. Like Luke could have transferred back home and been a superstar at his hometown at Nutley. He could have went to a, maybe a lower level of Catholic and got more time. He stuck it out. He stuck it out, stayed there, and look what he, 200 some yards the other day. That's what it's about. Don't run from it. To the young guys out there, stop running from competition. We'll mm -hmm. see you. You're going to only get better. Iron sharp and iron. Yep, iron sharp and iron, definitely. That's and that, that's prime example. But that talent level, St. Joe's best football is ahead of him. <laughs> oh, quick question. What's, what year is the running back? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, said, so, I didn't even met Train. Yeah, Train's a junior. Uh, so he comes uh, back oh, for another year. Last year. Yeah, he's a that's junior. So beast. so Train, yeah. Train is a junior. Uh, you know, um, Makai, these guys, they got dudes across the board. And what I do like about the uh, coming back to Catholic school is the competition level in practice. So mm -hmm. last year I was there like on an everyday basis and I could watch, you know, cause you're, you got offense, defense, yeah. and you know, it's a different thing. Their competitiveness is what it's all about. And you don't have to be a Catholic school to be competitive. You yeah. look at Irvington, look what they're doing over there. Yeah. Look at Millville down in South Jersey. You got, you got teams that could do it. So it's just a matter of, like I said, you want to make sure that you're competitive and that there's just not a lot of pacifying going on. And unfortunately, in this day and age, sometimes it's a lot of pacifying. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, continue on piggyback on that. Um, how do you feel the state of New Jersey football is right now? Because, I mean, I feel like I think when deep. we were in school, I feel like it was like the, I guess you want to say, like kind of breaking point for public schools. And like a lot, we started seeing a lot of kids get a lot bigger D1 offices. I mean, I think the year after you, Minka, Brandon Winbush, oh, like, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, and then like it just kept going and going, and now we're seeing players like from Irvington getting offers like, to Notre Dame. Yeah, four or five West guys, Orleans, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, Notre Dame. Like, I mean, the state of New Jersey football is in good shape. I mean, what I would like to see still more is every now and then, if you're that, if you're that team, if you're that Irvington, if you're you know West Orange, play a Catholic school every now and then. Uh, like I'm not, I think you want that competition. So. I, another one of my at, Pat, at Hackensack, I wanted to play them. I, yeah. No, I want to play them. I want to, because yeah. you really could see the level. You know, we we were close one year of almost upsetting Paramus Catholic. I think yeah. you were on the yeah. staff that year. Yeah. Like, so it could be done, you know, and looking at it, it really just comes down to, you know, having a good team. Irvington is prime example. I think Irvington, if they played some Catholics, certain schools this year, they, they probably would knock them off. Last year, East Orange beat Pope John. Mm -hmm. You know, you have different stuff. Irvington played DePaul close, I think, 20 to 6 or something like that, the score. So that is, is where it at. Now, the depth of football is a concern, not just in New Jersey, but across America, because kids, instead of playing football, they want to play video games. Yeah, yeah. So, you, you know, when you got that 6'3", 285-pound, neighborhood video game champ that's the problem, you, that's the problem you know that's you can't have that dude walk around and you go on and i used to go in, in schools and be like yo come on let's go now them dudes like they just want to you know eat fat burgers sink blood corn and play video games all day. it's different though so though. so can i give one advice to any no. parent that's watching? <laughs> that video game gotta stop the week. no video games on monday tuesday wednesday thursday 
Friday after school if they've had a good week of academics. Saturday and done by three o'clock on Sunday. It's we got to get control. Of it's that. different now though, because like when we were growing up, you feel me? We wasted a lot of times playing video games, and we could have been more active in sports. But now the kids are on Twitch, you can make streaming, money and anything. this one kid is making one hundred and five thousand dollars a week. Well, as long as he's not six three two eighty five. I hope he's. I, I, I hope he's the dude with the baggy pants. <laughs> Who does that practice? He was a five three. He can have it. Let him have it. But if you a dude, Fair you know, you know, you can walk in the building right now at any public school, and you go, "Oh man, what position you play?" I ain't playing. No <laughs> really? You know that? That's the dude I'm worried about. Now the guys who are making money off of it, I just hope they are 130 pounds soaking wet, <laughs> <laughs> no physical athletic ability like them dudes. They they can have it. But the dudes, we got to get them back out. And mm-hmm. and then the numbers have decreased in Little League football. I saw the Hackensack. No, yeah, you know, Hackensack that was tough. Down. The numbers went down. And then COVID came. Like COVID's role, the impact, we won't know the impact of COVID for a couple more years. But to get people back comfortable to get their kids back out, which is understandable. Which is understandable. We worldwide, three million people died. Yeah. You know, and they, So we get it. But in turn, some healthy just touch football. Uh, 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 neighborhood basketball game, stickball, yeah. you know, I, 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 this stuff like that. This the the stuff that doesn't cost you any money, yeah, you know. So sure. we may not be able to afford lacrosse and golf and all that stuff, but there's nothing wrong with getting the football and go out in the open field. Uh, the touchdown is down here, yeah. out of bounds right. over there. <laughs> no, no, don't knock him into the car. That's, that's, that's it. Or a good pickup game of, of basketball, a scutter, you yeah. know, a scutter yeah. basketball game. Those are the things that are missing. Those are the things that are missing. So we were talking about New Jersey football. So just your personal opinion on the state champions. So there's not going to be section champions anymore, right? It, am I am I right about that? There's no more section New there's, Jersey championship. It's going to be it's one just, champ. It's just it's one champ, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah how, how do you the feel bowl about champ. That? I, I like it. it was, you like that? We had a ball last year. I think I caught at least four of those games, <laughs> and I was at the East Orange Clifton game. Yeah. Uh, we went to MetLife and watched a couple of games. Um, I think that makes for great competition, you know, and it kind of. You can't do like Texas and some of those other places and play 16 games, but the level of getting to that 13th game is a lot to live for, you know. And then in New Jersey, we don't know if it's going to be two degrees or 75 degrees in November. Really? We don't know. So the weather is going to be a factor in all this stuff also. But I love to play out. And then the public, so I mean, the parochial schools have always played down to a true champ, and now they only have two. So it's only parochial A and parochial B. Oh, wow. So that is real competitive. Right. So I, I love it. I love the playoffs. I, I'm looking forward to getting back out there, being cold and watching games. <laughs> now, it was one thing about the playoffs. It all leads to MetLife. And um, we actually have a game on the 30th at MetLife, and St. Joe's is a part of it. Um, so talk to us a little bit about the classic games. Um, you guys are playing Donovan Catholic. Um, that should be a great game. And then our, our, our main game of the night, um, St. Peter's versus Don Bosco, um, two major games. Um, Tell us a little bit about... Uh, I, I think, you know, great matchup, St. Joe's and Donovan Catholic. Uh, St. Joe's showed that, have been shown that they can put up points. That was one of the criticisms in the past. They don't throw the ball. They don't do this. Mm-hmm. They don't put a lot of points. That myth is over, mm-hmm. you know. So I think with the coaching staff, with Coach Moranji and them, they're going to get the defense back in check. So their best football this season is ahead of them. Donovan Catholic has been strong down at the shore, but, I, I'm, you know, I'm a northern guy. You know, I, I like I like St. Joe's chances. Yeah. I think even with the amount of points we're scoring, we're a physical team. Yeah. Jimmy Mullen could change a game by himself to the end for, for St. Joe's. You know, he's that major. That's the wrestler? That's the wrestler, the All-American wrestler. He could change the game by himself. And then all those young guys around him are getting better week by week. So I like Joe's. I'm biased, obviously, with Donovan Catholic. Now, we played uh, Don Bosco earlier in the year, mm-hmm. and the running back, I didn't realize he was hurt. Heath got hurt and didn't play the second half. That's and he didn't, he didn't play this week. He didn't play this week against uh, uh, Iona Pratt. Oh, Ronnie. Uh, yeah, yeah, Ronnie. But the backup wasn't bad either. You know, that's the plus of here. But um, the line for uh, Don Bosco is kind of special. <laughs> I mean, uh, Chase teenagers. and all that. Uh, while you're looking at it, and last year watching Chase in person twice, we played them. He's an NFL football player. Like certain people, you could look at. He, if he stays healthy, does what he have to do. Where is he going? Texas A&M or yep. somewhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's an NFL football player. Like it's not too many players that you can say. If if I was a betting person, I said I'll put my money on Chase. He's going to <laughs> and I'm going to run behind Chase an awful lot. They also have a Hackensack kid that's on the line. He's good. They got they got the Hackensack kid, and they got one on offense and one on defense. Yeah. The two big kids, mm-hmm. uh, and they used to roam our sidelines yep. when when I was at Hackensack. But uh, 
that talent level at Bosco, the quarterback uh, was very impressive. Yeah. Uh, when we played them, you know, it was a lot of, you know, fireworks, a big score, you guys were there. Yeah. But the quarterback was a difference. Like, yeah, he really, sure. his advancement from this year to last year is unbelievable. So, shout out to him. I think he's committed to Delaware. And then the receivers, they got the little speedy guy going to uh, Campbell. And they got the tall kid, number four. four and yeah. then they got a bunch of little slot guys. Don Bosco, even though they lost out in prep, is not over. They're, they're going to be here. Now, St. Peter's, on the other hand, they got dudes. Yeah, they got yeah, dudes. I mean, good. Champ is going to University of Maryland. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Zion hey, going to Zion's going to Pitt. And, and, and my, my sleeper, uh, uh, Kenyon, he transferred from St. Peter's, uh, St. Joe's, and went to St. Peter's. I mean, Kenyon had 17 or 18 catches this week. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's a dude deep. Who he as a coach? He didn't even I, say nothing about blackjack. Yeah, where's blackjack going? Oh, yeah. Ohio oh, State. Wait, black, <laughs> black, oh wait, oh wait, blackjack may be going to NFL too. <laughs> <laughs> they may have two NFL players on that team. But Kenyon is is been their difference maker, and they got you know a young running back, always well coached. I mean, that's that game could be crazy. I I think you're gonna have two games that the fans are gonna be able to get their popcorn out, that's and great. don't blink your eyes. Don't. Those are gonna be two games, two great games. September 30th, MetLife Stadium. Yes, yes. September 30th, MetLife. I'll be there at MetLife. I'll be on the sideline. <laughs> Got my VF, VIP pass. I'll be ready to go. I can't wait. Now, um, I guess this is the last question, unless anybody else has any other questions. Um, mm -hmm. you, you left us with a lot of quotes, um, you know, from when we were growing up, and it stuck with us. Um, finish the drill sticks with me all the time. Where's the fire? Um, where's the fire? <laughs> where's There's the so fire? many quotables like, that we had <laughs> from you. Um, what is one of the main quotables that you live by and that you stand by that just leave just leave the people with one quotable that you uh, when it when it comes to football is family you know and and that's the one thing and I think about the you know coach Smith is coach Gerald Glisson who coached with me and was at east side you know family you know forget about me I love you that and that's taken from Rutgers but I think every program should have that implemented somewhere in their locker room. You know, every every week we had a, a quote or a word of the week or whatever, but family says it all, right? Because family is done to cover loyalty. Family is done to cover, you know, brother's keeper. Mm -hmm. Am I my brother's yeah. keeper? I got your back. Family is what it's all about. So, you know, to the young coaches, to the young people out there, you know, it's not about you. Uh, football is a game where you can't be selfish and successful. So forget about me. I love you. Favorite quote. Well, there you have it. Um, we are with Coach Wimbley. He's affected everybody's lives here. He's affected lives 110-fold. Um, he continues to do it. So we appreciate him being on our podcast. Uh, thank you, Coach. And, Thanks um, for having me. We'll see you next time in the Zone Podcast. In the Zone. Shout out to our sponsors. Oh, yeah, that's your job. Shout out to Joe's. Shout out to Joe's. Joe's.